Ralph here once again. It is February 28th, 1240 a.m., so good morning this Sunday. First data we're going to look at as far as what we compiled before we get into the research. Really good article in reference to B6 and its hypothetical use in helping ameliorate the uh, COVID-19 as far as uh, the severity of infections as well as possible infection itself. But before we begin that, now that we have more states dropping out of the mask mandate, we have some controls. So we can have some better uh, charts in reference to seeing what is working and what is not in regard to pandemic mitigation. And so we have here Florida, New York, California. Now, for example, here we have hospitalizations per 100,000. And then Montana, North Dakota, and Mississippi. As you can see right here, no mask, no mask, no mask. We look at the hospitalizations per 100,000 as well as the positive increases per 100,000. And I could do a better job of smoothing out these, uh, these lines. But as we begin, let's get right into the research as follows, and then we'll come back to this in a little bit. Do, do, do. Let's go here. Vitamin B6 may help keep COVID-19 cytokine cytokine storms at bay. Vitamin B6 may help calm cytokine storms and unclog blood clots linked to COVID-19's lethality, but research on it is lacking. At Hiroshima Human University, professor calls on fellow scientists to study its potential role. So generally what they've done is they compiled a lot of circumstantial evidence, enough to give basically a good uh, hypothesis in reference to B6 holding the key to help ameliorate many of the potential conditions as well as infections associated with COVID-19 as well as other ailments included, but to proceed as follows. Uh, basically, they, this could be the first step in showing the B6 potential in lowering the odds of a patient becoming seriously ill with coronavirus. I like this line right here. In addition to washing your hands, food and nutrition are among the first lines of defense against COVID-19 virus infection. Food is our first medicine and kitchen is our first pharmacy. Quoting the associate professor at Hiroshima University, I love to pronounce that name, but I don't want to be disrespectful by mispronouncing it, so please forgive me. Recently, many scientists have published papers regarding the role of diets and nutrients in the protection against COVID-19. Many of you that stuck with this channel for quite some time have recognized that diet plays a huge role, or I should say nutrition, in reference to correlation uh, from everything from transmission to the severity of infection as well as survival uh, to proceed. However, very few scientists are paying attention to the important role of vitamin B6. And she and her fellow researchers pointed out growing evidence. Now, here is the hypothesis. Let's look at the actual, I don't want to call it a study because study to me usually reference means they actually went e vivo or in vitro. But however, though, here is basically the gathering of evidence into the benefit of B6. First, let's look at this. All right, there is a basic chart. And the reason I'm bringing up the basic chart to begin with is because it's basic and easy to see. So you see B6 plays a role in a lot of these ailments which are generally related with increasing vulnerability to COVID-19. Now we get into the hypothesis. Whoa, big letters. Ba, ba, ba. Move down a little bit more. There. All right. Vitamin B6 is a water-soluble vitamin found in various foods such as fish, whole grains, and bananas. There are six isoforms of B6 vitamins. Among these are pyridoxal 5-phosphate, PLP, uh, pyridoxine 5-phosphate, I don't know, I'll have to research that in a little bit, it is the most active form and acts as a coenzyme in various enzymatic reactions. There is growing evidence that B6 exerts a protective effect against chronic disease and such as cardiovascular disease and diabetes by suppressing inflammation, inflammasomes, oxidative stress, carbonyl stress. Additionally, Vitamin B6 deficiency is associated with lower immune function and higher susceptibility to viral infection. In view of this, these or this information, we postulate potential role of vitamin B6 in ameliorating the severity of COVID-19 and its complications. Again, I'll have the links for all the articles for you on the YouTube channel so you can delve into it on your own. 
And the reason being this, in this article, we reviewed this precedent research to test hypothesis. It gives a wonderful, wonderful synopsis into the rationale, into the hypothesis, a reference to B6's potential unlocking of a powerful tool in reducing a lot of the negative outcomes in reference to COVID-19. So here we go. It goes right into the vitamin B6 and cardiovascular disease. Nice footnotes uh, in reference to that. Vitamin B6 and diabetes. Vitamin B6 and pneumonia. Vitamin B6 and immune function. Vitamin B6 and inflammasomes. And vitamin B6 in oxidative stress. And it gives a wonderful conclusion here. Here we summarize the available evidence suggests the potential role of B6 in suppressing the severity of COVID-19, possibly through ameliorating complica complications of chronic diseases such as hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Clinical studies in COVID-19 patients are urgently needed to confirm these possibilities. Of course, the sooner the better. In spite of the lungs being a primary target of the organ of SARS-CoV-2 infection, information regarding the role of nutrition and lung health is very limited. Considering the emergence of new viruses, nutrition studies on the lungs, a primary target of airborne viral infections, should be performed. Severe vitamin B6 deficiency is relatively uncommon, but some individuals have, might have marginal vitamin B6 deficiency, and B6 will be easily available as a dietary supplement with low cost and health risk. Just like D, just like selenium, just like zinc, just like C. Again, who knows if they're synergistic together, better apart, but that's for future studies which has to move forward. Interesting too. If you, some may notice here, carnosine. So again, another door opens. So let us begin to the next one. Up, let's move that one there. Boom, boom, boom. I must open them down. Let's close this one. Da, da, da. There, household transmission. This was done. This is published in the Journal of American Medical Association. Again, I'll have links for you. If someone in the house, for example, is basically testing positive for COVID-19, what is the odds of someone living in close proximity sharing you know table utensils couch whatever bed you name it now they claim the number is kind of high but to me the number appears low and that's probably because of a bias that i had if you're living with an individual you must have a higher opportunity to be at least testing positive even if you're asymptomatic our study showed overall household infection living with an individual is 10.1 percent now if you correlate that, and again, you want to use conjecture, if it's 10.1% while living with an individual, what is the odds necessarily when being at a restaurant, a movie theater, you know, stadium? And that's if you were next to an individual that is infected and testing positive and is shedding the virus so on and so forth, you get the picture. Again, 10.1, you could tell me if that sounds high to you. To me, it sounds relatively low. Not, not in reference to questioning the outcome of the data, but overall, is 10.1% seem high to you or not? But next, go to the next one, sodium. Now, interesting aspect, what's one of the first things to give you in a hospital, uh, in this only an IV? Saline solutions. So again, think about that to stabilize blood pressure, so on and so forth. But here we go. Abnormal sodium levels in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 predict death or respiratory failure. I'm just going to read a tidbit of the information. Nearly 32% of COVID-19 patients with low sodium levels, let's highlight that once again, at admission needed a breathing tube and a ventilator or oxygen through a face mask compared with only 17.5% of patients whose sodium levels were normal. Unlike excess sodium in the blood, low sodium levels had no association with an increased risk of dying in the hospital. But to think of it as a whole, that's really, really quite curious. Among patients with high sodium levels at the time during the hospital, nearly 56% died versus about 21% of patients whose sodium remained normal. So, it's an interesting aspect that goes up and down in reference to sodium levels being high or low. But if the sodium levels are in normal range, it seems to have a strong aspect in maintaining the odds of coming out with a very positive outcome. Again, not to be confusing, but there does seem to be a correlation. Correlation does not mean causation, but still, it's an interesting correlation that needs to be investigated a little further. So those that can directly affect the patient's care to proceed forward. 
This is real intriguing. Now, this tidbit of information should have been, at least as a public service, announced on major news networks. And if you want to read ahead right here, you perfect them yeah, go for it before I block it there. Because this is very important, especially as individuals come back into the hospital setting for regular diagnostic tests, especially in reference to breast cancer awareness and so on and so forth. This is important. This you've got to let other people know. Again, I'll have the links to the research article as well. This can make a difference in a lot of people's lives in a very, very, very positive way. We are, we're so focused necessarily on the COVID-19, we forget that there are other things out there that could scare people tremendously to proceed. What to do when a mammogram shows swollen lymph nodes in women just vaccinated for COVID? All right, here we go. Swelling of lymph nodes. Just do this. Swelling of lymph nodes in the armpit area is a normal response to COVID-19 vaccinations. But when they are seen on mammograms, they can be mistaken for nodes that are swollen because of cancer. In some cases, the nodes are biopsied to confirm they are not cancer. To avoid confusion by patients and the providers and to avoid delays in either vaccinations or recommended mammograms through the pandemic, Radiologists at Massachusetts General Hospital have published an approach to manage what is expected to be a fairly common occurrence as vaccination programs wrap up, ramp up. We had started to see more patients with a breast imaging clinic with enlarged lymph nodes on mammography, ultrasound, and magnetic resonance imaging. So here we are, three of things, mammography, ultrasound, and magnetic resonance imaging. As we noticed, they were coming to our clinic after a recent COVID-19 vaccination. Real real vital information and if anything for the few people that actually do watch this channel anything if you could share anything with anybody please share this all right next more of a trivia information as follows more than 87,000 scientific papers on coronavirus since the pandemic again that's just basically for trivia it took more than 19 years to go from 40,000 uh, to 4,000, 90,000 scientific, 90,000 scientific articles on that topic. So basically, within the start of the pandemic, 87,000, and that is up to I believe October 2020. Uh, that's just between what well, probably January, if you look at Asia, China, to October 2020. So we're still not having November, December, and of course now we're it past February. So that is just astounding. When you look at 87,000 papers, and that's probably why I think you get information overload. And a lot of the media tends to go, this is too complicated. There's too much out there. So they revert back to just the knowns, a few graphs, a few charts. We do this, we do that, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's been a routine, repetitive event, but for those who've been with me throughout the channel, there have been an incredible number of breakthroughs. But when it's those breakthroughs are buried under 87,000 separate research articles, you can see how we can get lost. But again, here we have what well, we have actually 87,515. So it's important to stay up to date. And again, information can change. It's a very fluid environment. We have antigenic shift, antigenic drift, different mutations, so on and so forth. And a lot of people are uh, piping it or embellishing a lot of the um, sensationalism of elements which imply the sky is falling. And we've known, since we covered this in the beginning, lots of incredible research has come out in reference to pandemic mitigation, which we know could have played a huge role in alleviating a lot of the severity of this particular pandemic. At least if not this one, maybe in the future. All right, let's get right into the research as follows. Let's begin. Ba -ba -ba. All right, let's go to the COVID world data. All right, here we are. This is what I'm looking at is, this is basically, well, let's go right here. So this is new death smoothed. All right, and what we're looking at right here is basically Let's go right here. This is better. New cases move. 
This is global. And I want to start at the bottom of the chart just to begin with. Look at your dates. Again, also pay attention to Y axis as well because you have different numbers for different, you know, different continents. If there's one thing I would love to see epidemi epidemiologist research is what the heck happened right about here on basically North America, Africa, and Europe. Again, that is a mystery, a, a mystery of correlation beyond that. So anybody had a significant number of basically COVID cases, that was weird. And so you see begin to drop. So this is March, March 1st they're going up to. Oh, it's the two-day lead. So it's up to date. It's on February 28th. And here we are again. We're looking at North America as well. Look at this drop. Now again, 250,000, 40. So when you see this huge spike, it doesn't mean like the plague has broken out again. No. Just remember that just that's you're talking a continent. And so in the South America. See, even then, South America at about fifty thousand cases is still, even though it looks more aboding, aboding. Uh basically as far as that, look at North America. You're not even down to fifty thousand cases as of yet. All right, we're looking at new death smooth. This is all of Asia, all right, Africa, Europe, North America. You see the massive drop there, Oceania, and so so forth. Things do that smooth and new death smooth per million. This gives you a better perspective. Seventeen and a half for Asia, fourteen for Africa. We drop down to about four, about the same for Asia. Europe is about 15 deaths per million. Uh, North America, still at a high six, it looks like. Oceania, 0.3. See what I mean how the graphs and charts can be deceptive? All right. And then South America, we're up to about seven deaths per million. So South America is actually higher than North America right now. All right, let's get right to the top, and then we'll come back down. There is that. All right, there is our global climate, new cases smooth per million, new deaths smooth per million. This is world. All right, so we go down, mortality percentage is positive cases. So it means if they test positive, how many actually perish? There's our chart right there as of now, starting from February of last year. So look at this. All right, now looking at mortality percentage, we're about, it's really weird. So we're about the same as we were close to February of last year. Cases, obviously not. But we weren't really, we, we weren't even testing. So you see that the, there's going to be confounding there because there's no testing. You can't say there was none. It's just that we didn't really begin testing yet. And then would be in July and August, we began testing uh, younger age groups under the age of 50, 40, and so on and so forth. So we started pulling in a lot of asymptomatic individuals. And so that created confounding as well to give the impression that the disease is spreading whenever we began testing less vulnerable, vulnerable groups. Ba, ba, ba. All right, let's go in and go on. Do, 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 do cases, do, 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 mortality percentage. All right, here we are. Look at the look at that drop again. The same thing. We're looking at great These countries, for those not familiar with the channel, we've been following for quite some time. Uh, Sweden made a little uptick, uh, but don't be so focused on the cases. We'll look at the uh, mortality rate, which will give you a little bit better perspective. Our Asian friends, they never entered the game. Never entered the game. It again, that's why it's, it's you'll see war in a second. Here we are, Sweden. Don't be thrown off by that. If I wanted to scare you about Sweden, that's what I would show you and only show you. But however though, situational awareness is the key word here. So there we are. And then we begin looking at uh do 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 Great Britain. And United States locked down. Sweden actually started going, their cases started going up and they started wearing masks. Again, when you deal with a potentially airborne, they never wanted to use the word airborne. Uh, but when you deal with an airborne, a micronized virus below five microns, uh, cloth masks tend to drop in effectiveness pretty dramatically. In fact, anytime they restrict airflow, especially balloon 15. Uh, 15 liters per minute, or whatever, something like that. It, then basically, it actually creates higher nasal deposition. So what I'm trying to say is it actually causes the virus to nest in the nasal membranes due to lower airflow because the mass doesn't block anything below five micron. If you're looking at 
common cloth masks. All right, here we are. And this is the rapid drops we began to experience right there on the red line. Doo, doo, doo. Cases. This is recently as of January 11th. New cases smooth per million. Boom. That is just um, unbelievable. But it's the way the data runs out. Uh, runs out. The way the data pans out. All right, there we are. And cases. Da, da, da. New deaths per million. Our comparative models. USA with lockdown, a little higher than Great Britain, Sweden, pretty low. And then remember, they had minimal uh, lockdown. Uh, even though they did start to raise their mask level to a two. We'll go to that in a second. All right, let's look at Sweden right here. New deaths per million in Sweden. Again, Sweden's our test because that was our primary control in the beginning. That's why we use Sweden quite often. So at 2.5 uh, deaths per million, compared to, you know what you're doing now is they're actually reporting on a daily basis Looks like they're forward filling. So meaning that unless they had exactly 3.126 uh, deaths per million for the past three days, that looks like what's called a forward fill in uh, data analytics. Uh, those not familiar, don't worry about it. Uh, new deaths per million in the United States. You see no forward fill here because the numbers change to so 6.192 as we uh, elucidated earlier. Do, 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 do. New Death Sweden, New Death USA. And so now we go to the United States versus all of Asia. Again, we're desperately looking for controls. We need to see if pandemic mitigation strategies work. And so, because you know, if our Asian friends are doing something that's working, like UV lights, decent diet, vitamin D recommendations, and we're not, then we have to be honest with ourselves and say, hey, we're not doing everything we truly can in order to. Uh, reduce the pandemic mitigations outside of these draconian measures that existed since the Justinian, Justinian plague. What was that the 1200s, 1300s? All right, let's begin. That lasted, Justinian plague, I think it lasted two centuries. Yeah, yeah don't, yeah, let's not go there. Uh, New Death USA versus all of Asia. And da, 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 da. All right, and here we are. Let's see uh, deaths per million, again, the closest Asian country you consider would be Armenia. There's the United States right there. Mortality, USA versus all of Asia. All right, there's India, which is far more populous than the United States. And it's interesting when I hear a lot of the irrational uh, in reference to why India is reporting so low compared to the United States, you start all of a sudden now India doesn't understand science and you can't do that. It's no, 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 no. I mean, come on, seriously. The United States has had issues where other Asian countries have not. I mean, what if it's just, for example, the secret's just capsation or cayenne or curry? You know, you have to be honest with yourself. There's something else out there that's maybe a huge role. Investigate. Just don't, negate. You know what I mean? All right, so let's proceed forward. All right, so here we are. Asia's total mortality is 397,990 due to the COVID-19. Out of a population of 4,463,000,000. USA total mortality, not to use this for entertainment value or basically to bemoan the United States because each one of these lives is important. But again, I'm reporting it because every life is important and therefore we need to really change direction in reference to what we're doing. Doesn't mean stricter pandemic mitigation lockdowns. If they're not working with, against our controls, then be honest and say, hey, what culturally is it taking the shoes off? Is it green tea? What culturally could be making a difference? 511,994 out of a population of 329 million. So mortality, 511,994 versus 397,990 on a population of 4 billion, 463 million compared to the United States population of 329 million. One death currently for every 11,213 individuals in Asia. The United States, one death for every 642. All right, there's our world, a little bit of an uptick there in reference to new cases smoothed. Looking down, our mortality percentage, Check this out. This is why you do QQ plots and you know things like that. So you can see if your your model actually works. And looking at here, 
and I'll show you the model in a second, which obviously that model that does not work. New death smooth per million. All right, we went from basically 1.67 on January 10th down to 1.176 out of February 27th. Uh, new cases smooth per million, 93.565, down to 48.848. And the mortality to vaccination, you'll see what I show for a second, new death per million world, da da da. Da 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 da. Uh, there's your mortality percentage in red against your new cases. So they're going to drop there. A few weeks ago, we had that X right in the middle. Now it's passed that way. And vaccine to mortality percentage. As you can see, the uh, red is basically the mortality, and the purple is those which are fully vaccinated. And then, boom. This is our model. For those not familiar, you see these dots all over the place. If the model was working, regression plot or whatever, then these should all be close to the line. When you see this, the splatter effect, nope. And then we go down there. This is what's called the QQ plot. Uh, nope, sorry, that's the, ah, court, there's our QQ plot, our quantiles. There it is. Nope, all over the place. But this is supposed to be a predictive model. If we're predicting properly, it should be going up this way. Nope, it's not. Why did I say QQ plot? Oops. And right, there's that. And there is our values as far as residuals. And yeah, that's just but when you see dots all over the place, it means the model, which are originally we have postulated in the beginning, is not postulated, not a little bull. All right, just like my language. New deaths cases per million world. Do, do, do. See, look at the drop there. That's from January 11th downward. And we have some nice little shading here. Do, 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 do. You can see because it's real tough to see the shading because you see like uh, Europe is down here. Oceania, no. But you know, North America has played such an incredible role on the world stage in reference to COVID-19. You know, that's that's another thing. You know, you count on your news sources for international reporting. And if something bad happens, yeah, they tell you. But if, some, if someone's doing something good, like, you know, Dan or Taiwan or Japan or whoever, you know, and you, we just, we'll just forget about mentioning that. All right, so there's that. And there's our Asia plot. Uh, this is basically new cases smooth. There's world again. Area plot. Da, da, da. Let's go through this guy. I did this better when I put them together. You'll see there's that. New cases smoothed. Look that. Look that. And this is new cases smoothed again. As you can see, they're all dropped. You know, if the, if you know you're looking at if you if you if the continent was already pretty low, it seemed like we began to lose that correlation effect necessarily, depending on the population base. Uh, but otherwise Again, this is just an incredible mystery to me. Africa, Europe, North America. I can understand maybe even the chance of one or two of these continents basically being possibly in the same hemisphere or geographical proximity. Uh, but you're talking with massive cultural differences, dietary differences, seasonality changes, so on and so forth. And yet close the same day that's like you know, one of those dr evil scenarios um again don't know but epidemiology wise that will be an incredibly intriguing investigation all right so new death smooth but yeah see well again of course the correlation between deaths and and positivity but there there's your new death smoothed and uh smooth per million is probably a better way to do it now we're talking an entire continent. There's Africa. There's Europe. And I know is we have a huge prejudice. We're going, well, Africa must not be reporting it. You know, that is, again, we have actually, we have incredible, uh, how I describe it, uh, epidemic alert systems in Africa because of Ebola, Marburg, and so on and so forth. 
so early warning systems, I should say. So I wouldn't put it past the fact that they're not reporting it. They have some pretty uh, intense uh, investigative tools out there. All right, there's that. And then again, North America, we said six point something. There's right, right on target. Oceana, 0.3. Again, really scary chart. Uh, without, if data analytics can be used, you hear the term weaponized uncertainty. Well, the problem is with these charts, a lot of the, I don't want to keep on using the word media, a lot of individual, the media, because multimedia, TV, news, whatever it is, uh, they use charts to inflame and rage and cause irrational fear. You know, that's kind of evil. All right, and let's go this way, investigating correlations. Do, 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 do. All right, there's our world chart. Do, 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 do. Well, that's like so again. You look at correlations, uh, for those not familiar, it's called the heat map. And for those with a heat map, you're trying to find something above a 0.7. So let's say, for example, you're looking at a stringency index, and you want to see if it makes a difference in, let's see, uh, new death smoothed. All right, so you want to see like a negative 0.7, not a negative 0.024. So let's see to make the difference in cases. Actually, maybe because we're, you know that's probably the wrong way. You want to see a negative, not a positive. Uh, but again, no correlation unless you see a 0.7 normally. Deaths per million, stringency index. So you, what you're doing is you're seeing the stringency, the stringency index seems to play virtually no role in, again, this is a heat map. It's, it's, it's conjecture, I want to say, or we're postulating based upon fairly weak data. But outside of that, it doesn't seem to, outside of the stringency, stringency index correlating with the stringency index, there doesn't seem to be much correlation outside of that. Yellow, for example, is what you want us to try to look for. Like, for example, you see age 70 year older, you see this yellow here, boom, which correlates with the median age of the country. So if you see any of the yellows, let's say, for example, outside the ones, let's say right here, total deaths per million and total cases per million, you see a correlation. And you see here, age 70 year old, median age, where do you that? Because it crosses references. So basically, you're looking at, they should, I regret they didn't have this yellow all the way down to a 0.7 level. But you can see how it works. All right, let's keep on going down. Do, 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 do. Life expectancy, we went through this. I'm just going to screen through this because we covered all this earlier in reference looking at correlations. Uh, all right, let's see how is the United States doing when we started this. And last week we covered it, we got up to 5.74 last week. And now up to where our death per million actually increased, even though our caseload went down. So let's just say 6.2. And all the country is doing better than the United States is right here. So Mexico, Poland, Brazil, United Kingdom, Italy, Germany, all the way down the line. All right, now let's keep on going. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I keep on running down that part. World mask. Again, this is really weak because do you notice the uh, OID or our world in data uses, you know, the United States had level four, but we already have states which are not complying with uh, mask mandates. But they still have mask mandates for four listed for the U.S. And so, you know, it, it it's you take it with a grain of salt. So our date is February 27th. It's February 28th right now. So last date was February 27th. So let's go. Do, 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 Let's see if there's anything interesting. Uh, facial coverings. Remember, you want to look for probably orange or green if there's any correlation with anything with facial coverings. Uh, again, real world settings, not lab settings. Nope. In fact, I saw a research article in the American Academy of Sciences where they rationalized the benefits of masks saying it resulted in a 10% reduction in COVID-19 infections. And then I came down to the data sources, which was SurveyMonkey. And yeah. All right, there goes that. And let's keep on. Do, 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 do. I was going to SurveyMonkey is not it. I mean, it's great that... I mean, you could talk to biostatisticians all day long in regards to the biases in reference to surveys, uh, especially solicited surveys like, such as that without a survey taker. Uh, the whole world has been jumping in on the mass thing. Why not? Because it's great for conditioning of the population. 
do 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 do, which I'm not for, not because I said that. And this, this is remember, keep in mind, zero is no policy. Which remember we had a few of the countries here now, but they're all jumping in except Vanuatu and Syria. Uh, Sweden went up to a. So this is one. Where did Sweden go? I think Sweden went up to a two. Look at all the countries which are twos. Just means in sensitive areas, which is okay if it's like a, a long-term care facility or something like that. Russia, Somalia, Iceland, Hungary, Monaco, Germany, you know, Estonia, Djibouti, Djibouti, China, Nigeria, Poland, Dominica. Where did Sweden go? Well, I'll show you where Sweden. There it is, Sweden, right there, two. Again, that's one of our controls. United States, mass level, um, historians are going to have to do it because it's too political. But you can see right there, deaths per million, mass level, da, da, da. Uh, cases per million. Again, use your investigative uh, tools at hand and see if it makes any difference, what's, had made any difference whatsoever. Uh, da, 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 United States, this is uh, test per thousand uh, cases per million. You see that gap beginning to grow there? All right, that's important. Sweden, is, which is really interesting because it seems like they really, every time they raise their mass level, issues began to happen. But deaths per million, that's the main thing to focus on, dropping pretty significantly. Uh, even though, again, the psychological aspect, are we, are the Sweden, when they raise their mass level to one, then they raise it to two, they are doing more testing. So, again, it's the chicken and the egg uh you know, logic, which is one, which goes the other. Uh, but however, though, there's your cases per million, there are more testing, and there's the mask. And so, do, 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 I'm just going to go through here. Japan, Asian friends, uh, mass level one. People think that all Asia is mass level four. No, that's just an assumption. Uh, Japan, there's your test per thousand. Uh, purple, cases per million. Look at that. That massive, uh, basically, chasm there starting. New Zealand, there's your deaths per million. There's your mass level, obviously, the same. There's your cases per million. There's your cases per million in tests per thousand. It's not making much of a difference. New Zealand is New Zealand. And then Finland. Finland. And again, this is Finland's like the only player which got kind of weird. Out of all the countries, it just it was like weird, meaning their their cases began to go up, and that I don't know why. Test per thousands, uh, they just decided right now. It looks like someone just said, "Hey, let's just shut down the testing as the cases per million begin to rise." India, again, the biases and prejudices aside, look, that's just the way. That's deaths per million. Red, far more populous than the United States. They've had a mass level of four. I can't tell you if it works or not. No controls, but whatever that is, uh, the population that dense, and with poverty and basically everything else like that, it's pretty amazing. India, mass, green mass level, cases per million. Again, just don't get mad at me. I'm just presenting the data as it shows. Uh, red, Ted, test per thousand, cases per million. Pretty strong chasm there. Chasm, chasm. Spain. Mass level one up to four. That, that, that's deaths per million. It's being, look at the drop in the case per million. Again, it's just very intriguing about all the exact same time. It's had these drops. France, don't know why I had the mid November thing. Uh, there's your um, basically your test per thousands and basically your case per million. United Kingdom, United Kingdom, big drop. We know about that. They're testing like crazy. Look at that. Look at that difference. That separation. Italy, they were ravaged in the beginning. Uh, the dot mass level four, deaths per million. Again, depends on how people comply. Cases per million, testing like crazy. Look at that chasm begin to grow. You see right there where it basically was almost like parallel. And but that's what it is. And you had a high number of people who are testing positive back close to December. And now look at that drop. All right, da, da, da. I think that's it for that one. Let's go to the States. All right, we'll come back to that real fast. 
do, 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 do. And I guess it's 120, so we'll be wrapping this up really soon. After we look at the vaccine levels. The CDC changed the way it reported on its vaccines. So it kind of messed up my data scraping in reference to what I was the information I was pulling down from the CDC. But the reason being is because it was getting sloppy anyways. Remember last week when it was showing like reporting week by week? And then you have Johnson & Johnson introducing their vaccine too. So actually the CDC made it easier to report on the vaccine distribution. But you have to be aware of how they did it. I'll show you that in a second. All right, I added a basically our mask-free zones to generally our, um, our data analytics. Looks like Montana has some weird spiking there. Positive per 100,000. Again, it, the objective is yeah, it's going down, but really what is making the difference? Again, it, does stringent pandemic measures make a difference or not? It looks like the states which don't seem to really do much are doing just as well, if not better, than the states which are going hyper over it. Difference is, again, pandemic mitigation has collateral damage, not just to businesses, but to mental health services and so on and so forth. So, you know, you just can't take a whatever approach. It, people do pay a price. The difference is in those states, which are not having severe pandemic draconian lockdowns, um, I guarantee their happiness levels are probably higher. Let's see, that's that. And what's this one here? Death increase totals. We'll go down. Let's go back down here. Do, 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 do. Positive per 100,000. Again, California, Florida, Iowa, Montana, Mississippi, North Dakota, New York. You tell me. New York and California are now becoming kind of our controls because these states right here dropping out of a lot of the mitigation factors where California and New York seem to be hanging on tight. Can you tell a difference? Let's see. I guarantee if you're a business owner, especially if you own a restaurant or some sort of food facility, you can tell a difference. Uh, da, 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 we went through that. Went through that. Go there. And here are our charts again. Positive increases per 100,000. Again, pay attention to the y axis. I'll try to get them all on the same axis next, <laughs> next time. But right here, see the spike? See so yeah, a little bit of a different change here but they all seem to experience the same thing again there's so many weird correlation numerically wise as far as why did so many of them go up to 140 or close to the 140 area then begin to drop why this spike why do they all have this sharp narrow spike and again if you're looking at this as far as let's say a bell curve or you're looking at standard deviations as far as one standard deviation two standard deviations or whatever it is it's really weird because it reminds from a statistical standpoint, it does kind of remind you of a bell curve uh, because the way all the majority of the data tends to, well, we're not looking data, we're looking at just a spike. So I should take that back. But you know what I mean? Uh, Montana, I don't, Montana, I want to check their data real fast. So don't pay attention to this too much until I can validate it because I'm looking at numbers all across the board. North Dakota, you know, again, they all have that mountain in the middle. You see Mississippi, really low. And then we look at basically hospitalized per 100,000. Again, we're, well, here we're talking closer geographies. But look at that. This is hospitalizations per 100,000. January, January, January. Ah, eh, Iowa again, a little bit ahead of time. January, North Dakota. The spoiler, November. And of course, Montana, I'll check the data too. But you're seeing a lot of correlations, which again, are rare because you're looking at areas which are basically boom, 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 boom. So look at the top half of this. That's freaky. All right, let's keep it going. Now a little further, population data, hospital occupancies. Here we go. Do, do, do. And we look at this information. Let's pass this because it's, yeah, this is better. Percentage of impatience uh, with COVID. And so there you have California. So this is a percentage of the, uh, basically of the beds being used. And California, Texas, Georgia, Maryland, and New York are really primarily our five top major problems reference to hospital, uh, hospital usage. Not problems, but as far as, you know, Reducing room for a basically um, or creating ICU bed 
crisis situations where you may worry about not having enough. All right, but when you look at the other data as a whole, you'll you'll get an idea that you know maybe uh, there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel. So here we go. Total IC beds, IC beds estimated uh, being used. So for example, here's California. There is Texas. So you have IC beds available, but this can include pediatric beds and things like that, and it's also staffing issues as well. The red line right here, I have that at 72, which gives us a pretty good bearing in historical hospital occupancy. And so we hear of California right now is heading towards the historical levels of hospital bed occupancy. Now keep in mind, as COVID patients begin to leave the hospital, a lot of individuals who have been waiting for other surgeries will start filling them up. So again, this line can stay pretty much, or these bars can stay pretty much slightly above the line indefinitely. And so here we go, IC bed utilization. Do, 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 do. Here's our charts over time. Alaska had a spike, that's why I put it on there. But green, California, there's your inpatient beds used for COVID. You see the drop right there. New York, do, 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 Florida, really low. Again, we recognize the pandemic mitigation uh, aspect of it is relaxed compared to New York and California. We keep it going, do, do, do. Iowa, no mask, there we are. Again, we're looking at medical resources being allocated. There is uh, North Dakota, right there. There's your y-axis, pay attention to the numbers to get an idea. Montana. So people may be testing positive, but however, though, the hospital uh, resources are being marginally used in effect for COVID as nowhere near as much was regularly postulated, speculated, conjecture. There I will use the word conjecture. I mean, it's nice to always be prepared, but again, I think uh, we have to be careful of what we sacrifice for that preparedness or whom we sacrifice for the preparedness uh schools so on and so forth but there gives you an idea again do 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 and now let's go to the vac more vaccination data now here's what we have here now I give you a little bit of an idea looking at the cdc just real fast all right they move their allocation data back over here and they're really just doing the totals now even though I kind of question the totals, for example, first dose being 54,990 here, and the second dose total, uh, you know, down the line to have that correlation all across the board. Um, numerically, it looks like incredible logistic uh, accomplishment or, or basically some sort of rounding. But get back to the data as follows. See right here, they changed the data. It messed up my charts. So I only have a little bit of information here available in reference to vaccinations until I get it fixed. All right, vaccines distributed. And here we are. This is full delivery. What I did is I combined both the uh, Monera and the Pfizer, Moderna, Monera, Moderna and Pfizer's vaccines basically combined into basically one data frame. So, and then just basically added up the, uh, the totals. So the CDC report does make it a little easier to get at least the full delivery amount. Whether that is actually being injected or not is a big question because I still have this issue with Oxford and they're looking at basically only 6.8% of the population being fully vaccinated. You notice how they don't include a large part of the world here in their fully vaccinated area. I guess they have something against the Sputnik vaccine or they're not reporting. But otherwise, outside of that, uh, just looks like the US is the primary one vaccinated. The reason it's important too, is a lot of people going to try to correlate the drop in cases and mortality in reference to the vaccine. Now, that, that's going to be a real strong psychological ploy, and it's going to create a, a selection bias in the minds of a lot of individuals thinking, oh, the pandemic is over because the vaccine is out. Well, interesting thing, though, there could be less testing because the vaccine is out, so there could be less vigilance in reference to that testing. And so you could have an interesting uh, uh, player in reference to why so many, so few or the dramatic drop in positive cases and possibly mortality. Because again, they may not be testing 
patients who have uh, other comorbidities as far as having COVID at the exact same time. But I digress. So 6.8% is basically what they're showing on their data. Let's look at our data. And again, I'm just going by the second dose delivery of what's been reported by the CDC. There's our data there. Do, do, do. Complete vaccine administration. This is at a population level. I took off the scientific notation. Pay attention to basically that data there. You see style plane. For those information, for those information. For those not familiar, if you take away that style plane and you go boop, and you what can happen, see? Back scientific notation. But back that style plane. Again, this is just for the data analysts out there that are amateurs like me. And do that. And then boop. And now your scientific notation goes away. Interesting trick. Just remember that. All right, there's that. And there's our percentages. See, the full, if basically just to leave every shot, second shot was being administered with precision from the first delivery to the second delivery. So if everything was done perfectly, our vaccination rate should be somewhere around the 17 to 18% area, except for New York, which is always lagging behind. But however, though, again, looking at the Our World in Data, they're only showing 6.8%. So again, take with a grain of salt. So there we are. They're doing a date is as of February 28th. And yeah, it's February 28th. Here we go. Da, 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 da. Can't do it without sound effects. Hospital to vaccine comparison. It's down to the 28th. So basically, uh, what we're looking at right here is generally that green. So what we're trying to do is to see if the vaccine was actually making a difference. I can't tell you. Uh, Alaska is pretty heavily vaccinated. Illinois, a little on the lower end. New York, again, if someone could explain to me why New York is always lagging, it'd be great to know. But you see pretty much it's across the line. And yeah, there it goes again. And that is it for our data for tonight. Again, let's cover the research as follows outside of the always, always bizarre uh, correlations in reference to the dramatic drop uh, in basically cases, uh, currently also too, let's see real fast. Let's see if you notice, there's a little bit of a, um, what I wanted to show you, if I had the information available is generally, there is a little bit of a, if you look at the, the curvature, it reminds you kind of, of, a, of a, um, quadratic equation. And I got to find the chart there real fast. I may just go back to that a little bit later on. We have this basically this this curve, which is really, if those are familiar with, uh, you know, old algebra, looks pretty much like the old curves from the quadratic equation. And so I unfortunately lost it, and I am not going to bore you with that anymore. Let's see what, no, I have to look at, look, 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 look. And nope, not there. I'll find it later on. But otherwise, outside of that, let's look at this. Do, do, do. Data. We covered. Let's go backwards. 87,000 scientific papers reported up to reported, produced uh, between the start of the pandemic and October 20th. And it is now February 28th, 2021. So who knows how many more we have had written and published by that time. Which the problem is this, 87,000 scientific papers is great and it's noble and it's a great effort on a global, on a global scale. But there's a lot of other things that require research as well, just to keep note. So basically like from school to education to everything else, the world went on pause due to these pandemic mitigation uh, efforts. And oh, history will tell whether any value to those efforts whatsoever, or if they were corrosive. Most important thing, I cannot stress enough mammograms. Again, the correlation between basically certain areas, lymph nodes swelling shortly after COVID-19 vaccines and those getting tested for breast cancer. That is vital now because as there are less COVID-19 patients in the hospital, there is going to be an event where more people are going to go back into those diagnostic tests for cancer at the exact same time, which 
is going to raise the opportunity for misdiagnosis through the roof if not enough people are made aware of this correlation between vaccines and swollen lymph nodes. Sodium levels, kind of iffy on that, but it goes back and forth, something to pay attention to. Household transmission, someone in your house has uh, COVID, and one in 10 chance you may actually become positive to COVID living with the individual. All right, then we go back to this, B6, which is the star of the research this time. Hypothetical postulation uh, in reference to correlation. Let's see how many words we get to rhyme at one time. And so reference to the B6 and potential benefit in alleviating or mitigating a lot of the negative effects of infection uh, with adequate levels of B6 or the form that they mentioned, PLP, right over here, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. Again, gratitude. Thank you for listening. Ah, it's 55, 56 minutes. And I look forward to see you all once again next weekend. Or if you want to do it, the, the information which we do on Tuesday on the, spe on the specific reports in reference to a nutrient or two, um, I'd be more than happy to see you on Tuesday. Gratitude. Thank you. It is 136. If you're still with me now, uh, wow. I greatly, greatly appreciate uh, following through with me. Catch you all next time. Bye.